Heads in the Cloud, your source for future-proofing your business. All right, welcome to another episode here of Heads in the Cloud here with James Brennan and Joe DeLivo, where we are talking about IIoT Industry 4.0, as well as transforming your business to be ready for the future. Um, and, and for this topic, I'm so excited because Joe worked really hard writing a, an article for Opto22 for their blog, the art of the, or sorry, the art of the possible, and we kind of want to dive in a bit more about that. It was the art of the possible, an epic dream machine for Ignition Edge, and I think that James and Joe have some interesting insights in terms of how you can use that to your advantage, uh, as well as how that would help in terms of moving your business along to being future proofed. So, James and Joe, you guys want to go ahead and jump on into it? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll as well commend you, Joe, on the well-written article. I think the uh, the Opto product in particular does uh, does speak volumes for itself, and and I I know we've very selfishly chosen it because it uh, solves a lot of the problems that our end users have with how to bring ignition into uh, into the plant when they're using a cloud-based infrastructure, or cloud-based architecture. Uh, do you want to talk at all about the uh, the the wonderful things you wrote about? Uh, totally. Well, it was it was a good opportunity, I think, to you know sort of look at the product in the space of the edge and edge computing and edge devices. And you know, for us having cloud offerings in manufacturing, you need to have uh, something that's living on site um, until we have five G cells everywhere. Uh, maybe someday in the in the future, it'll probably be seven G by that point before it's actually I won't, practical. I, I was gonna say I probably <laughs> won't get it. I'll have my tinfoil hat on, so the signals won't get through. Exactly. So there's always a need to have something on the edge that's going to be doing buffering and in the case of ignition, local control um, fallback. So uh, the edge uh, devices are uh, uh, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, ignition actually has a program called Ignition on Board where they will effectively certify certain devices for using Ignition and Ignition Edge. Um, Opto happened to have one of those solutions and one of the big differentiators and I'm going to talk more about this in the blog, but definitely a big differentiator is that it's a true PLC. So not only are you putting an industrial PC there that you're running Ignition on and maybe other software, but it's a PLC and it can communicate with field devices as well. So um, you can have kind of a, you know, a one-stop shop, if you will, for doing all of your local stuff. And it just goes along with that theme of trying to reduce the footprint of, you know, this equipment that you have in the plant that somebody's got to manage and deal with upgrades and updates and all the stuff that we kind of talk about in the context of factory stack. I, it's funny you called it a dream machine for factory stack. I actually think it's a dream machine for OEMs. Um, I know OEMs maybe uh, maybe don't get as much uh, attention on on our kind of blogs and that kind of stuff. But if you think about the concept of having to have some sort of onboard controls that's running your piece of equipment, but then also needing to host an HMI and also needing to and wanting to be able to offer your clients additional value by being able to do things like you know remotely monitor alarms and manage uh, your systems and benchmark their systems versus the rest of your install base um, for the cost of a PLC and actually cheaper than a lot of uh, larger manufacturer PLCs, you can get PLC functions. You can hang remote IO off of it, as well as you can communicate to the cloud. You can do all sorts of advanced features using Ignition, but also uh, Node Red is on there. Um, you yep. can run Codasys, you can run, um, I'm a, a VPN, uh, a VPN client off of there. It's got two network cards on it, a firewall. Um, Joe, I probably missed a bunch if you want to fill in the blanks, but you know, it, 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 I guess I look at it from, from a manufacturer's perspective. It's a really great way to, to very effectively connect in, uh, to the cloud and, and to make that edge piece work. But, you know, for folks that are actually deploying systems as OEMs, I think it's a, it, it's also a dream machine for them as well. Oh, it totally is. And I think it, it also sort of, you know, walks a fine line between being open uh, and being too open, which is something when you talk about security and all of that, that, that becomes a, a discussion. But I mean, it is, it's an industrial PC, it runs Linux. And, uh, you know, to, to Opto's credit, it's an opt-in process you can, you can go through if you want to get a license to get shell access to it, where you can pretty much do anything, uh, limits the warranty and support and things like that if you go ahead and do that. But um, you can use it like an industrial PC in that case. But by default, it's very much 
locked down and they take kind of a batteries included approach where it's got the software that James is talking about. So you can do most of the stuff that you'd want to do and it's supported by Opto and those applications are basically baked, including Ignition, are baked into the firmware. So you're not just doing these upgrades kind of willy nilly where you might break some compatibility there. Um, you're going to flash a new upgrade or new firmware version, which is going to include all these things packaged together, which has been already tested and, and kind of validated to work together. So it's just a really nice package for doing all of that um, without you having to do some of that yourself with any old industrial PC um, on, you know, that you can get on the market. So, yeah, and, and and not to knock industrial PCs, I think there's definitely a lot of use cases when you're when you're looking at higher bandwidth or needing storage or wanting to run databases um, where, you know, maybe the Epic isn't always the best fit, but certainly a lot of the use cases we've seen things like running OEE systems centrally and doing all of your data collection and buffering at the edge. It's, it's really a, a perfect fit for something like that. Um, maybe we want to transition from that though and talk a little bit more about well, what do you do if I need more than you know more than what a simple edge device I don't want to call it simple to me justice, but a um, a purpose built edge device can do to something that can actually run full workloads. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, you even take a step back, you know, even within sort of the Groove products line, you've got the Groove Rio, um, which doesn't have the nice screen, which is another really nice thing that the Epic comes with. Um, but it basically will just let you do uh, I.O. Um, uh, communication, and it's actually also can have Ignition Edge built in. So that's for kind of the, the lower end when you're just basically interacting with devices. You have the Groove Epic, which has more of these industrial PC uh, functions as well. And uh, with the newer version, the PR2 module, um, that's actually powerful enough to run uh, Ignition 8, the full-blown Ignition 8, uh, and everything that comes along with that, like writing scripts and connecting to, to devices. Um, that gets you pretty far. Um, but to James's point, then there's the point where you want to start, you know, supporting other software. You want to have databases that are running locally. You have other software that may or may not be containerized, or maybe it's it's packaged up as a virtual machine and you want to run that. And that's where we start looking at the edge as sort of this component within a hybrid cloud um, architecture. And there's more applications, there's more stuff that you need to be able to, to run locally. And there's a lot of options out there. Um, some of them have been around for a very long time from companies like Nutanix. Um, some of them have a common virtualization, you know, hypervisor platform like VM we're running on top of them. And then the cloud vendors as well have their own solutions that also kind of ride on top of that. But those are going to be for larger workloads, um, but still consolidated in terms of having everything kind of in one place and then having, uh, in some cases, you know, a subscription or a leased model that you can kind of get these from a, from a vendor to support. So I know you've you've looked at a, no, a number of these, James. What are What are some of the ones that you're familiar with? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's neat. So disclaimer is that they're not available in all regions yet so you do have to be pretty careful uh, especially if you're not in north america to make sure that if you're looking at these things that that the hardware as a service model being offered is something that uh, is available in your region um, but you know the big three aws uh, gcp and azure all have uh, basically edge offerings that uh, that you can lease from them uh, different costs different capacities uh, AWS is called the Snowball, um, and it was originally kind of built and designed as a as a data capturing device that you would mail back, so you could uh, you know transport that information up in back into your cloud instance. Um, what they realized was people didn't want to give it back because it was pretty useful to have that compute capability on the edge. Um, they have different models with uh, with graphics uh, capability for doing image processing. Um, and in, in kind of the industrial use case, I mean, they're capable of running a Kubernetes cluster and virtual machines, so you can you can do quite a bit with these. Um, again, their form factor is uh, is designed to be relatively uh, useful in an industrial environment. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, for example, the Microsoft version does does go in a, a standard uh, a standard rack. Um, but all of them kind of do similar things in that they'll allow for you to for all intents and purposes, carve out a little bit of cloud uh, down inside of your factory and then be able to run that using services that you deploy through your cloud console, um, but operate on-prem. And you, you really are able to handle things like internet disconnections and, and you know, high or sorry, low latency application requirements, things like running batch servers and data collection and that kind of stuff. Um, while still getting the benefits of, you know, using cloud-based tools for things like monitoring and disaster recovery and, and management. 
Um, as well as in our case, you know, we operate a, a orchestration engine on there. So, you know, there's some self-healing capabilities of the applications themselves when they're deployed in this kind of an architecture. Um, the other two, just, just for reference, so uh, Google has what's called the Edge Appliance, and then Microsoft has the Azure Stack Edge. These are the single unit uh, purpose-built um, you know, edge edge uh, hybrid devices that you can lease from uh, from each one of those companies. And uh, Joe, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about what what once you grow out of those, what the next biggest option is. Yeah, well, it's just interesting to look at those devices and see how they've kind of evolved from that use case of just kind of capturing data and then shipping it back to the cloud provider to dump it into their object storage model, kind of like the snow. Uh, ball that James was mentioning. Um, but, you know, beyond just doing local vision uh, processing or inference of machine learning models and things like that, um, I think all three cloud vendors now have realized that, hey, there's actually some real compute power and we could take advantage of running any our, uh, any applications there locally. Um, and so you can get pretty far with some of the, the resources that are there. They're comparable to maybe other, you know, let's say like a Dell Rack server that you might be able to get yourself, but of course they're managed by the cloud providers. When you need something bigger, then you can kind of step up to larger offerings, which again, the cloud providers have. Um, so instead of like a, you know, a, a one U or two U rack units, you can get like a full blown rack. So AWS has uh, outposts. Um, Google has a different uh, distributed cloud uh, product that is uh, again, more akin to having a, a full rack. And then Azure has partnerships with some other hardware vendors via their Azure Stack HCI or hyperconverged infrastructure family. So there's a few devices in that family as well that are just aimed for more powerful workloads um, beyond what you do on kind of one of these little uh, quote unquote smaller edge devices. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the options out there really make the case that you really shouldn't be installing standard hardware anymore, kind of the old fashioned way that taking advantage of using a hybrid model um, from a from a sensible use of cloud, even if you still plan to operate all of your actual workloads and your applications on prem, um, the benefits you get from the operation model is just is just tremendous. Um, I also thought there's something pretty cool that AWS did a couple of years ago is they have a product called the uh, Snowmobile, um, <laughs> which if you Google it is uh, the most ridiculous thing I've I've seen in a while. It is a tractor trailer with 100 petabytes of storage on it and used to uh, suck data out of whatever uh, sources that you need and then drive it back to the uh, the AWS data center to be ingested. So. I have not found a use case for that yet, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm still looking. Be part of our backup strategy for Factory Stack and Pharma Stack, I think. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I love awesome. it. So cool. guys, th this is about the end where we're going to wrap it up. I appreciate everyone for listening into the Heads in the Cloud podcast here with James Bernan and Joe DeLivo. And, and don't forget that if you wanted to actually check out that article, the Art of the Impossible, or sorry, the Art of the Possible. Uh, an epic dream machine for edge ignition uh, from Opto22. You want to make sure that you head on over to Opto22 and their blog. So you can check it out right on their website. An epic dream machine for ignition edge. You're listening here on Heads in the Cloud. See you guys next week. Heads in the Cloud, your source for future proofing your business.